As Canadians, we like to think of ourselves as international peacekeepers. It's hard to admit to being a nation of wife beaters. But family violence has long been a major social problem in Canada, and the silence of society has ensured the silence of the victim. It took me a whole day of sitting there with a the number almost in my hand, and then suddenly I realized that that's where I had to call. I had to, I had to admit what I was, and I had to, I had to talk about it. And I'd never felt like that before. I had to face what I was. I was a battered woman. Hard enough to face on a personal level, harder still as a community. In London, Ontario, and in Winnipeg, a start has been made to analyze the problem. We're talking about a society that, in one way or another, implies, if not specifically directs, that men should control women or certainly have the right to control women under certain circumstances. I think what makes the concept of battered women look so strange to us is we look at it in isolation without recognizing that in our culture it's totally acceptable for men to exert their power and authority over women under certain circumstances. Those circumstances, I think, revolve around the notion of ownership. It's inappropriate to beat someone up at a store. It's inappropriate to punch an elderly woman at the bus stop. But when you get home, you can do that with your wife. When I started on the department 13 years ago, the social agencies, the churches, community, society as a whole was, was saying to the police, stay out of domestics. You can keep the peace, make sure nobody gets seriously hurt, but, but in the whole, stay out of it. You know, reconciliation was the real was the real thing, just to keep the family together, no matter what. Uh, a neighbor would see his neighbor's dog, or hear his neighbor's dog bark, late in the evening and would call the police. Uh, at the same time, uh, he, that same person would see the man hit his neighbor's wife and, uh, and not call the police. So we would receive more training in the dog pound bylaw than we would in, the, in domestic violence. The web of silence that surrounds every battered woman draws tighter around the middle or the upper class wife. They are the invisible victims who rarely show up in transition houses or in statistics and whose cries are stifled by the status quo. I think people have the illusion that it's a problem that only happens in the, the lower socioeconomic classes and that's just a myth. It happens across all segments of society um, in all ethnic groups. In London, I think we're much more fortunate than many other communities. Not only do we have this transition house, we also have a clinic called the Battered Women's Advocacy Clinic, which offers legal advocacy and more emotional counseling for women. So we're really fortunate. We also um, offer some services for men, a program for men who batter called Changing Ways. We work well together, we refer to one another all the time depending on whom we're seeing and what resource might best help that person in particular. But I think if we didn't have all of those resources working together that each of the facilities would be weaker. What makes the London Coordinating Committee on Family Violence so effective? One reason is that its members are people deeply committed to changing attitudes in society and they are people with authority in their own organizations. Another reason is the ongoing research initiated by Peter Jaffe on which the committee bases its recommendations. The most fascinating thing for me as a member of the coordinating committee was watching individual members respond to the research results. Um, I think the most astounding thing was the day we presented the data suggesting that on the average women had been assaulted 35 times before they called the police, or before their neighbor called the police. And beyond that, we discovered that 20% of the women had been referred for some sort of medical attention for injuries received, but the police only laid charges in 3% of those cases. We presented that data, and everybody turned and looked at Inspector Robinson. At first, one was afraid that that would be the ultimate stumbling block, that nobody would really change based on the numbers. The change that was required was for the police to take wife battering seriously, to begin to treat it as a criminal offense. 
there was a research project going on. And so often with research, we got stuck with statistics, which many of us didn't like. Uh, in fact, they hurt. But taking a realistic approach, we forgot the statistics and sort of looked at what we were doing. Uh, blamed the Crown because the Crown wouldn't prosecute. The Crown says, I always prosecute. Uh, if you don't put the charges here, I can't prosecute. And that's, in fact, fair. So now we, we lay the charges, the Crown prosecutes them, the courts, in fact, do convict. They don't just say, well, this was a domestic disturbance, but not really a criminal offense. Courts in Canada do not have a good reputation when it comes to convictions for wife abuse. Half a million women are battered each year in this country, but less than 5% of these cases ever get to court. Order in the court, please stand. Provincial Court Criminal Division is now in session. Please be seated. Mr. Martin, would you advise the court of the docket, please? We have one case ready to proceed, Your Honor, that of John Jones. Thank you very much. Mr. Mamo, is your client ready for plea? Yes, Your Honor, he is. Mr. Clerk, would you arraign the accused, please? Yes, sir. Are you John Jones? Yes. John Jones, you are charged that on or about the 6th day of October in the year 1984 at the City of London in the County of Middlesex that you did assault Mary Jones, contrary to Section 245 of the Criminal Code of Canada. Mr. Martin, how does the Crown elect to proceed? As a summary conviction offence. How do you plead to this charge? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. The justice system plays an important role in shaping our attitudes and behaviour. Up to a hundred years ago, it was legal for a man to beat his wife, so long as the instrument used was no thicker than his thumb. This was the so-called rule of thumb. The attitude, if not the law, still persists. Go ahead, please, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mrs. Jones, uh, on Friday, the 5th of October of 1984, were you living with your husband, uh, who is the accused before the court, at 1255 Main Street here in London? Yes, I was. And was your husband with you at the time you went to bed? No, my husband uh, was working late, and so I just went to bed before him. And then, were you awakened sometime early in the morning of the 6th of October? Uh, yes, I was. And uh, at what time was that? It was about quarter after three in, in the morning. And what was that that awakened you? Uh, my husband uh, came in and he was hitting me. So he struck you? How many times did he strike you? And it was push, shove, pull. And eventually he... Um, pulled me into the bedroom and put me on the bed and sat on top of me and just kept beating at my head until I could see nothing, like, like light stars, blue, red, every color. And two days later, I had my operation, which I was very afraid to take the anesthetic. I was very afraid that I wouldn't wake up because of the lumps in my head. I didn't know what exactly had happened to my head, um, which is a fear I still have. I still have this fear that something is going to be the matter with my head for all the blows that, that I have taken over the years, because that was the safest spot to do it, because nobody could see. All right. Now, what was it that uh, stopped him hitting you? Um, I was... I was screaming. Um, our, our little boy uh, woke up in the next room and, and he came in and, and he was crying and screaming. And, and then the police came to the door. Do you know who called the policeman? I think it was, it was one of our neighbors. I, I wasn't able to call the police. I see. I don't even think the woman should be asked whether she wants charges late. Uh, if the officer says, I have enough evidence to substantiate a charge, and I'll lay it. Turning to a woman and saying, do you want me to lay charges or will you testify, again is putting the nose back on her shoulders where it does not belong. That's our, we don't ask people if they want charges laid out of a traffic accident. We don't ask people if they want charges laid in a murder, murder case or break and enter. Why should we in wife assaults? But for every woman who does call the police, there are ten others who don't. 
he threw the suitcase right across the, the kitchen and hit me in the same disc that I had been doctoring with for six months. That was the first time I had to tell my doctor um, what had happened. I found I couldn't, I couldn't think of a lie to tell, which was the first time I really didn't have a lie. I kept dreaming all night, like, where, how can I tell him? Like, what, what could I have fallen against? I couldn't think of anything because it had to have been a, an object that come at my back badly. I was so afraid that um, a piece of bone might have been broken off and I just didn't know. It was so painful. But my doctor said now that he can see in retrospect exactly before something happened or after it happened. But he had his head in the sand too and he couldn't, he didn't want to know. I think generally we discovered that uh, the response we got from, from doctors, that they had missed 29 of every 30 battered wives in terms of the incidents that they were, we were, that they were reporting. Women said over and over again that each professional they talked to, whether it was in the criminal justice system or the mental health system, tended to treat them um, not so much as a victim of violence, but rather uh, somebody who was responsible for bringing the violence on themselves. So over and over again, the message we got was couldn't we do more to educate family doctors, uh, the clergy, police officers, judges? Uh, what could we do to educate these people uh, so they could be much more responsive to the needs of battered wives? In London, the Battered Women's Advocacy Clinic was set up specifically to meet those needs. We've been open for just over a year and a half now, and we have met with or assisted approximately 1,100 women. Almost 500 of those women have actually attended our office and received counseling and emotional support from the advocates and myself, providing legal information. 66% of our clients are employed. 25% of those clients are employed in professional or managerial capacities. That means that we see a large number of clients that would not go anywhere near a shelter. Okay. Good morning, Battered Women's Advocacy Clinic. Can I help you? How can I help you? When the proposals were submitted to Health and Welfare Canada, the Crown Attorney in this community was particularly concerned that because of the legal component of the clinic, there would be an interference with the criminal justice process. There's no doubt that the participants in the courtroom scene are very aware of the presence of the monitors. They see an individual sitting in the body of the courtroom writing, and they become a little bit more careful in their attitudes and their presentation. And I'm sure that the bench uh, becomes aware that there is a monitoring of his, it's usually a, a male judge, his attitude and his comments and the disposition on the offender. Initially, we were afraid that we would have people interfering with us in our work, that we would have uh, critical watchdogs uh, looking over our shoulders. Not that we are afraid of, of uh, being observed because naturally everything we do is in an open courtroom and we're subject to the criticism of the public and, and the observation by members of the public. But we, we were afraid that we would have this type of, of critical observation which might uh, affect our witnesses and might uh, therefore uh, uh, hurt us in, 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 in our uh, attempt to do our duty. But uh, because the people here in, involved in this Battered Women's Advocacy Centre are so helpful, we find them an assistance rather, rather than a hindrance. And they too have been of help to me in that they have provided a report which indicates some of the family background that was not apparent. Our clients are very frightened and what we try to do in our initial contact with the client is to make her feel at peace and to relax a little bit. We do believe her, we believe everything she says and we're very supportive. As a result of that, she can relax a little bit and start making some decisions as to what she wants to do with her life because that's why she comes to us. When I called there the first time 
It was the first time in my life that I had heard, we are not really concerned about how you and your husband are handling the problem, but how you are handling the problem. And that, for the first time, made me feel important. It made me feel... Um, I thought about it so many times, and that woman is worth her weight in gold. Do you know whether or not the police laid a charge? Yeah. You must be uh, pretty exhausted right now. Yeah. 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 Um, can we just can we just move back a bit first, though, and um, concentrate on your safety at this point? Um, I just can never forget her. Just the softness of her voice that somebody really cared about me, and that was it was such a good feeling. Along with moral support and legal advice, some women need physical protection for themselves and their children. They come to a shelter. We see women who don't have a supportive family network, who just don't seem to have friends to turn to, and are really uh, fearful uh, for their, their personal security. And so they really do need to come to a shelter like ours where, you know, the doors are locked and that sort of thing all the time. Thomas, Thomas, come here. Let's read Barbara Papa. Huh? Children cannot help but be affected by the violence done to their mothers. The Women's Community House and other shelters like it have trained child care workers and special facilities for children. Uh, I remember of a case where there was three young boys involved. Uh, the mother was very seriously assaulted. And I, I talked to the boys about, the, uh, about this, what they did when this was going on. And they told me, well, they, they would watch television. So you can just imagine, you know, I, I just pictured it, you know, here, here this, the, they would tell me things like she would, the, the husband would wrap a towel around the hand or he would drag her up the, the, up the stairs by the hair. And I can just visualize the children just being glued to the television and not really watching what they're really watching, but just hearing this in the background, this being installed in their minds as, as, as this is the way of life. Now what's, what's really scary is that what happens when they're older? More and more of the research suggests that boys who witness their fathers assaulting uh, their mothers have a 1,000% higher rate of, uh, of wife battering than boys who don't witness this violence. So we know pretty clearly that we have to do some things uh, with, with children to, to prevent this uh, the cycle of violence. No, no. Basically, I think we live in a society uh, that condones violence against women. I mean, it's, it's all around us. I mean, you see it when you go to the movies. Um, you go watch a movie like Body Double, Brian De Palma's new movie, and you see a husband killing his wife with a power drill. Um, and that movie is, is leading the box office in terms of receipt, receipts in Canada for the first week that it's showing. Um, I think that tells us what we think of women in our society. I was 20 when I was when I was married, and I think that I thought that uh, everybody stays together for the rest of their life. That um, when you get married, it is forever. And I've often wondered if that's why I stayed so long, is I didn't want to admit that my marriage was a failure, that I thought that something I was doing was wrong, that, um, it should stay as a family. Our friends thought that we were a happy family. But that wasn't, uh, you can't take a picture of what's inside. I think the last vacation we had was when we went to Florida for two weeks. And I suddenly looked at the situation a little bit differently and thought we went with friends. He couldn't be violent in front of friends. Um, and I think for the first time in my life, I thought, why should I put up with this man when I just have two weeks that are really nice? The other 50 weeks are, um, hell. I think the woman at that point is, is, has two possibilities. She can either say, I am living with a violent man who is occasionally nice, or she can say, 
I'm living with a nice man who's occasionally violent. She's going to choose the second one especially in battering relationships, but in male and female relationships in general, men tend to control the finances. They may own the house. They may own the car. They may, in some sense, have power over the children, so the woman may not feel she can leave unless, because he's keeping the children there. As well, I think there's a very strong role in our society that women should, above all, remain faithful and loyal to the man that they're involved with, regardless of what he's doing. So we have statements like, stand by your man, Half a man's better than no man at all. You made your bed, now lie in it. Those kinds of statements which basically are telling the woman that even if she could get out, it's not a good thing. It's not what a real woman does. My client is prepared to attend counseling sessions, yet we can't simply deal with Mr. Jones. We have to ensure that the whole family remains together. It's vitally important, therefore, that uh, Your Honor would, would not consider any kind of a jail term. It would be disastrous to the family and it would take away the very thing we're trying to accomplish, which is to keep the family together. I realized I think I did my children more harm by staying together than I had if I had left when they were much younger and gotten out of the situation and none of us would have been scarred so badly, hurt so badly. One of the most frustrating things that uh, uh, our agency could experience in trying to help battered women is that when we provide her with information as to what her options may be, if those services are not available in the community and if they don't work together, then her options become extremely limited. And that's why in smaller communities and rural areas, the women very often return back to the home because there are no options, the services are not available. If a limited number of services are available, they don't coordinate, they don't work together, they don't communicate. So, for example, we are in constant contact with the police, we're in constant contact with the Office of the Crown Attorney, we work with the Probation Department, Parole Services, and the Transition House. And we can therefore provide a very integrated network for the woman so that she feels that she's not falling into gaps of service and doesn't get lost in the system because the system is tremendously formidable. The support groups are one of the referrals that the advocate can make when she's talking to the client initially. At that time, if the woman wishes to, she can enter into the group and basically it is, it is a support mechanism for her so that she can share her experience, her fears, her concerns, her guilt, her anger with other women who have found themselves in similar situations. We were taught that we were worth something as women, that um, we deserved more, we deserved better. We were taught the characteristics of a battered woman. We were taught the characteristics of a batterer. And they are so common. Like out of 15 points, my husband had 14. You just keep it up and keep it up and I'd... Yeah, no, I, I, know, I don't, can't think of the number of The times. profile of a battering man is the profile of your average North American male to whom violence, in certain circumstances, is quite acceptable. Therapy can help a batterer, but only when he acknowledges responsibility for his violence. One night we are having a quite an argument, and I was getting quite hostile at that time, and I didn't want any violence. I was getting scared of violence. I was scared I was going to hurt her more than, you know, just a bruise or something like that. So I went for a walk that night, and I ended up walking to the London Police Department. And that's when I went in for help. I asked him, I says, I need help because I feel like I'm going to beat my wife. Well, I was nervous because I thought I was the only one with that problem until these other people started to talk. And I found out there's a lot more people out there with the same problem. And I started to really get involved in it. I really started to talk. I really started to express myself. In fact, it's the first group in my life that I've ever been in that I could sit in and tell the truth and not hide nothing. And as far as I'm concerned, the medication, pills, or anything else, that there's no medication but the change of weight program for me. And it's helped me, and I've gone on almost a year without violence now, so that's pretty good. Now, Mr. Jones, uh, stand, please. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I've heard from counsel. I'd like to hear something from you about what you, your future behavior is going to be like. 
That's not going to happen again, Your Honor. Again, well, I like can imagine uh, that you might say that. Everyone says that when they come here. Why is your position any different than anyone else's? I just, I just feel it won't happen again. Well, Mr. Nice Jones, I hope you realize that uh, these sentencing in these matters is very difficult. The object of the court is to try to do something in order to impress upon you that the community will not tolerate this behavior any longer. So it's 12 months probation. You're going to keep the peace and be of good behavior. And you're going to take part in the Changing Ways program uh, as long as that program is open and available to you. Now, do you have any questions, sir, about, the, uh, about what's expected of you? No questions, Your Honor. Well, don't come back. Thank you very much. Please stand. Provincial Court Criminal Division now stands adjourned. I don't have to lie anymore and pretend I'm happy. I have never felt this content in my life. I can um, come home and I can sit and have a cup of coffee. I can listen to my own music. I can, um, I can buy the clothes that I want to buy. I can just, I can just be myself. And I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm okay. I'm a good person. And I believe that now. I see myself for what I really am. And I have come a long way. <laughs>